So welcome again to another edition of Elevate Career Discussions. Um, for those new to the platform, I'm Kaushik, the founder. Um, my background is in private equity uh, and I was an investment banker prior to that at Goldman Sachs. Um, Elevate is the premier career platform for business, finance, and investing careers. Um, we partner with professionals from top firms in the world and top professionals like David here to provide resources, training, networking, and recruiting opportunities to students and young professionals. Um, we're partnered with 50 plus top undergrad and MBA universities, as well as hundreds of firms. Um, and the best ways to reach out and find out more about Elevate are on our Instagram, which I'll link to here, as well as on our website. You can find out a ridiculous amount of information that you can find directly from professionals. So over the next few weeks, we're hosting several of these sessions with uh, PE Investment Banking, VC uh, professionals um, in the space. So you should check those out in our newsletter. But let us get to today's session. We are super excited to have on David Horowitz, a private equity industry expert and a young veteran, if, if there's such a thing, we'll, we'll go into to why that is. David's had a kind of a very uh, in wide array as well as depth of experience within, within private equity in a lot of different capacities. Um, and so, you know, he's a partner right now at, uh, in private equity at Pine Island Capital and works with a very distinguished team there alongside founder John Thane, who you, some of you guys might know, ex-CEO of Merrill Lynch. Um, prior to that, he was a, a founding member at Goldman Sachs Special Situations Private Capital, as well as managing director at, at McCrary's private equity team. So he's also a proud Penn State alum. And, uh, and so we're ex super excited to have David on today uh, and uh, let us get started. So David, I'd love to uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Cool. Um, hey, so I'd love to kind of, I gave, I gave a sort of an elevator intro for yourself, but I, I would love for you maybe to start off and tell the audience. So the audience is composed of, um, you know, students, professionals in the industry, MBA students from kind of our partner schools and, and outside as well as, you know, professionals outside of that. So in that context, um, I'd love if you could just kind of give a quick intro and your background so they have context to sort of your career journey and highlight anything, you know, interesting along the way. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for, for having me. This is a really uh, exciting platform that you've uh, that you've built out here, and, and I'm sure one that everybody who's participating, you know, appreciates getting access um, to events like this. So, um, yeah, my name is David Horowitz. Um, uh, I you know I'll I guess I'll start from you know growing up in Philadelphia. Uh, ended up going to Penn State. Um, I was in the Honors College there. Was very involved in our. Uh, investment foundation, which um, is now called the Nittany Lion Fund. It's a $5 million real money investment fund uh, at Penn State. And it you know, really gave me a, you know, a appreciation for, um, for Wall Street and, and analysis. And, and I ended up um, uh, having an opportunity to join Goldman Sachs uh, directly out of undergrad. I'd had a number of different internship opportunities when I was in school. Um, I did sales and trading for two summers. Uh, I actually worked in private wealth management for a summer. Um, and then when I went to interview full time, um, you know, I sort of told people, look, I really like the markets and investing, but I don't want to do trading. I want to do something um, a little bit more um, longer term oriented, you know, instead of making a hundred trades a day or, or a thousand trades a day, you know, maybe I can make a couple trades a, a week or, or a month. And, and so I ended up um, interviewing for positions that, you know, kind of fit that description and, and found my way into uh, what at the time was called Goldman Sachs's Special Situations Group, which was a collection of uh, different proprietary uh, or prop trading groups that had come together under one umbrella in the early 2000s, um, most of which uh, had a fixed income background. So some sort of, you know, lending or um, buying of things that had, you know, fixed cash flows associated with it. Um, so I started in that business um, first couple of years doing uh, leasing. Uh, so buying things like aircraft and locomotives. Uh, we did a satellite deal with, with XM radio. Um, and then after about two years, I had an opportunity to uh, raise my hand and be one of the founding members of, of the private equity team that we were building out. So we were expanding the business beyond just fixed income, um, you know, getting into providing other types of capital because Goldman had you know, such a large and flexible balance sheet, we could, you know, do everything from senior lending all the way through to buying businesses and providing equity for businesses. So I uh, joined in with the um, private, what we called private capital investing team, which was really a, you know, private equity strategy, primarily um, focused on growth equity in later stage businesses. So companies with revenues anywhere from, I think the smallest thing we did was maybe 30 million of revenues to businesses that had several hundred million of revenues and providing capital to those companies to help them grow, make acquisitions or use for any other corporate purpose, including uh, liquidity for shareholders. Um, 
I was there for um, you know, about uh, nine years um, and started to you know, look, um, uh, start, started to see our business, um, you know, sort of transition. We had seen a lot of good people leave our business uh, and go elsewhere. And then I happened to get a phone call from a headhunter about this position at Macquarie, um, which was uh, basically starting a very similar business to what we had at Goldman, a you know, more of a special sits or opportunistic investing group. Um, and I had the opportunity to go over there and, and really help build out a business, um, which was really exciting to me at the time. I'd spent my time at Goldman, you know, sort of being a, a cog in the machine. Um, we, had, you know, we had built a business there, but I was a junior guy. So now I had an opportunity to go um, as more of a senior person, as a senior vice president at the time and, and help build a business. So I spent the next five years at Macquarie. Um, that business grew very rapidly from zero to 12 billion of, of capital deployed. Um, and then after a while, I started to get a little bit of a bug to do something a bit more entrepreneurial outside of the four walls of, of the investment banking environment. Um, and so uh, in my discovery process, I met um, two former Goldman Sachs partners, John Thain and Phil Cooper. Um, Phil had built and ran Goldman's private equity group, um, the, which is the fund of funds, secondaries and uh, co-investments business. And then John, um, you know, many of you may be familiar with his name. He was the president of Goldman Sachs uh, when the company went public in, in the late 90s and through the early 2000s. He then um, went on to be the CEO of the New York Stock Exchange when that went public in the mid 2000s. And then he came in to rescue um, Merrill Lynch and sell it to Bank of America at the depths of the financial crisis. So he's got a storied, you know, sort of Wall Street career, and they um, came up with this idea to partner with former politicians and government officials in order to create a different kind of private equity firm. We're, you know, we're sort of just like everybody else in terms of our strategy. We want to buy and invest in mid-sized companies, but we have this really unique uh, partner group that's attached to our firm, former U.S. senators, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, senior military officials, uh, senior State Department and Defense Department officials, and the idea is we can invest in businesses where our network expertise, influence, and access can really help those companies, whether it's from a uh, uh, you know, business uh, customer introduction perspective or legislative or regulatory affairs, or even elevating the status within existing customers like the US Army or the US government. Um, so that's what we're, we're focused on uh, in, my, in my current role. And um, you know, hopefully that gives you a good perspective of my of my background. I think I'm a bit unusual in having spent, you know, so long at places. I feel like uh, in this day and age, people, you know, hop around every every two or three years. Um, so I've, you know, in, in my 16 or 17 year career, I've, I've been at three places. Super helpful, David. I think, so we have a packed agenda. That, that introduction is super helpful. Um, we'll go through the stuff on the agenda and then we have a bunch of Q&A that folks that submitted. So we'll, I'll give the opportunity for the students that submitted or professionals that submitted that to ask them that. Um, one thing on that point before we jump to the agenda, what's your general sort of advice given the range of people in the audience of the topic you just mentioned, right? Kind of dedicating, uh, we are in an era where I think when I look at the Elevate platform, like I'd say the average age of but the entry level is two to three years of how long they stay at a job and then go do something else. So sort of what are some of the pros and cons in your mind of trying a bunch of things in your 20s versus sort of staying at one place and getting to a senior level like you did at Goldman and then beyond. So maybe you could start with that. Yeah, well, look, I mean, and just to start out my, you know, my pathway was, uh, you know, call it lucky. I mean, I, you know, I put myself in a good position, but I was fortunate to be, you know, two, three years into my job, exactly where I thought I wanted to be two, three years from then, you know, so you, you normally are faced with that decision. Should I go to business school? Should I go to a PE firm? And from my perspective, it's like, well, if I went to business school right now, I would want to come back and exactly have this seat. So why would I go to business school? So I, I, I'm a little bit of a different, you know, a different animal from that perspective. I was I was fortunate to be in the seat that I wanted, and and so for me it was uh, actually kind of an easy decision to stick around at Coleman as long as I did. But my advice for for people is, um, you know, it, it, it's it's really about your career trajectory. Like where do you want to see yourself? And then putting yourself in that position from a career perspective, you know, too, too often people, I, I got this advice a long time ago. I mean, pe too often people change, um, change jobs because they don't like the job. You, you got to think more about your career and less about your job. There's very few people in the world who like their job and like their career. Like LeBron James is a good example of somebody who likes both probably. 
but most of us are either, you know, stuck in a job that's fun, but maybe is a little bit dead end and not headed in the right direction, or in a job that's maybe challenging and there are things you don't like about it. But when you think about the career and where it's going to take you five years, 10 years from now, might be lucrative. And I, I guess the, the advice I would give on that front, Kashik, is to you know focus on the career element and, and less on the job element. And if you think you're in a seat where it's going to get you to where you want to be, then you know, then don't go jumping around. But if you think you're in a seat where you know you're not learning, you're not expanding your network, you're not um, having upward mobility opportunities, that, that's more when you want to start thinking about looking around. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I completely agree with that. I think, I think also assessing every six months, every year, kind of pros and cons of where you are and where you want to be to kind of add on to what David said, is usually really helpful because we're so knee deep, knee deep all the time into kind of, you know, heads down and what we're doing. Um, sort of maybe let's start with the private equity job, right? So obviously you've spent and seen it across different levels. Um, maybe your sense of sort of what, what are the key aspects of the job in your mind, um, both from skills developed as well as sort of the skills needed to be successful on the job. And maybe you can tackle it from a junior person. So like an associate perspective, and again, from sort of a principal and director perspective. Yeah. Um, so, so from an associate perspective, I think um, it, it's hard to um, describe how important it is to be a resourceful person, somebody who can take a problem and just figure it out. Whether that problem is how do I pull comps on a, on a private company, or how do I model an acquisition and a merger? You know, being able to like figure it out and, and problem solve, I think is the number one um, you know attribute that I look for when I'm when I'm interviewing associates, looking for for associates, or or even uh, you know at the at the junior VP level. Um, you know, so many people I think are trained to do something in a very specific way and and only know how to do it in that one lane. And, and that's, you know, that doesn't, ha that happens a lot in investment banking, a lot of rote repeat type work and the people who succeed in private equity relative to investment banking, I think are the ones who, um, you know, can handle curveballs being thrown at them. So if you're sitting in an investment banking seat right now, you know, maybe one thing to do is try to raise your hand and see if you can get involved in other things than what your, you know, your normal opportunity set is like. So if you're in, I don't know, if you're in an indus industry group, Maybe you can help out with a leverage finance related project or an M&A related project or, or something, you know, to sort of get outside your comfort zone and see how you can stretch your imagination. One of the things I benefited from early in my career was being able to work on so many different things, leasing deals, tax driven deals, lending deals, equity deals. Um, and that range of experiences, I think, really benefited me um, in terms of expanding my, my resourcefulness and my problem solving capabilities at, at the VP level, um, you know, it becomes more about, you know, your, your business sense, um, you know, savviness, like understanding, um, you know, why we might or might not want to invest time in something and then, and then acting accordingly and making recommendations. You know, I rely on my VP to, um, you know, to really make, start making decisions, important decisions about, how much time are we going to invest in, in, in researching this particular company or, um, you know, or should we kill it? You know, time is money in this business. It's all you have is, is time and you, you need to manage it ruthlessly. Um, so I think once you start to get to the VP level, being able to make those decisions about what's a good business, what's not a good business, where's the upside, is this something that fits our mandate, fits our profile, that, you know, that becomes um, a really critical function um, at the VP level. And then in addition to that, executing, you know, when you're a VP, the VP is, in my opinion, the hardest job because you have to wear so many different hats. You know, you're like, you're, you're, you're sort of like too senior to be doing some of the work, but you got to farm it out. And sometimes you got to pitch in and sometimes you're too junior to be doing, you know, you got to like juggle between being kind of senior and kind of junior. And, and a lot of times that means you have to do, you know, more than your fair share of the work in order to keep the wheels on the bus. That's why a lot of people refer to the you know, the VP or the principal position is sort of the quarterback on the deal. Like you're really the one holding the whole team together. Agreed. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think it's also the, it's the learning along the way. And one thing I encourage all my uh, other students with an elevate, and, and, and I want to get your thoughts on is sort of, you mentioned this idea at the VP level to really be able to drive decisions on companies, understanding their good business models. I completely agree with you. I think that's what we do as well for, for all, all people at that level. 
how does one start building that? So a lot of the people in the audience is, are, you know, undergrads or MBA students, or let's start with undergrads or young professionals who are just at their first job. What are some, you know, maybe tactical recommendations you have that people can do? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, it's hard when you're an associate or an analyst to carve out time because that's like the one thing you often don't have. Um, so it is really important to, um, to, to try to do it. I think one, one thing I could recommend is, you know, periodic um, check-ins with whoever you're directly reporting to, whether it's the, the associate, the staffer, a VP, whoever the right person is, um, in order to, um, you know, just talk about stuff that's like not front and center, like talk debrief on a deal you worked on a month ago, you know, brainstorm about why did we do it this way? Why didn't we do it that way? What would we have done differently? Um, you know, why, why don't we do this when I've seen other people do this? I mean, asking those sorts of questions when you have a little bit of time is super important. And, and I think the way to do that is to try to get a standing monthly, bi-monthly um, uh, coffee. Uh, it's, it's harder in this environment, but it's also in some ways easier in this environment because people aren't traveling and, and they generally have more time available. But getting a coffee on the calendar, whether it's your VP, maybe it's your MD, um, you know, once a month, once every other month, you know, be respectful of that person's time, but it's, it's a no agenda catch up, but where, you know, your goal is to talk about business and to learn not to be doing comps and, and, and modeling and, and whatnot. It's to, it's to take a step back from that for 30 minutes and just pick that person's brain, um, and, and learn from them. I, I, I really think that's the, the best way to do that. Got it. It's super helpful. And then one other thing, I agree completely with that. I think the more dialogue you have with people who are senior, et cetera, um, even if you're already in PE or investing roles, kind of poke other people's brains on why do they do this deal or why not? And I think you could learn a lot that way. And then on your free time, maybe spend digging into companies, right? And, and kind of taking a differentiated approach, even if you're in college, right? Pick a company every every month and, and dig in. Um, sort of, you know, the, the, the somewhat related, I want to get your perspective within the PE industry, staying, staying there. Um, you you started your career in sort of the mega fund land, right? Goldman, um, you know, special situations, a PE, and then also spent a lot of time with now and, and potentially with McQuarrie on sort of in, on the middle market transaction. So maybe can you compare and contrast for the audience a little bit? Um, your, you know, some of the pros and cons between, you know, mega fund, large cap deals and, and sort of the middle market space. Yeah, sure. Um... You know, and, and just to be clear, I mean, at, at Goldman, I was still focused more on the middle market. Gold, Goldman had the mega fund in, in PIA where you spent some time, but but um, because we were on balance sheet, we were, you know, mostly spending time in, in the middle market. But, um, you know, my, my view on the middle market is, frankly, it's super competitive. It's like unbelievably competitive. It's more competitive today than it was five years ago. And it's, you know, more competitive than five years before that. There's new PE funds being formed every single day. And so I think it's just incredibly important that you try to find a seat where you have some sort of, you know, edge or, or advantage um, where you or your team can, can rise above the rest. Um, too many firms just simply compete on price uh, and leverage um, and they don't do well in the long run. Um, and so, you know, I've structured my career around that advice. I mean, I, you know, Goldman is obviously differentiated because it's Goldman and we can get meetings with whoever we want. And if it's a tie, we're going to win. Uh, but also at Goldman, I had, you know, a really, um, you know, sort of interesting capital advantage where we could do anything from first dollar senior loans to buying whole companies and everything in between. So we could, you know, had all these sort of products that um, companies might need that uh, of that other other people couldn't do, you know, nine out of 10 PE firms couldn't do the types of structured deals that we could do. So that gave us an advantage as well. Same thing in Macquarie to a lesser extent than Goldman, but had a brand name and had this really flexible um, balance sheet. We also had really low cost of capital at Macquarie, which was another an ad advantage. And then when I moved to Pine Island, um, you know, I've already described it a bit, but I think our, our partnership group is incredibly unique. There's, there's really nobody else out there that has a group that, that looks like ours with the possible exception of Carlisle. And I'm happy, you know, being in that company. So, um, you know, I've, I've always tried to make sure that I'm, you know, somewhere where I feel comfortable that I can, I can utilize, I can sell that that advantage or that edge that that the platform has, and I think that's um, I think that's really important when you're thinking about 
if you want to get into middle market private equity, think about where you're going and why it's a good fit for you and, and, and how you can exceed there because a lot of it is very undifferentiated. Yeah, that's a great point. I think this is generally good for when you think about any sort of fund or firm, but that's amazing advice because sort of you have to, before you kind of look past the name, look past the firm, I think really understand, um, you know, what is, to, to Dave's point, is it cost of capital? Is it, you know, the brand name? Is it the relationships? You know, what are the unique differentiators about that firm? And then how do you fit in, in terms of your own strengths and weaknesses and how that fits in there? And are you able to take advantage of that platform? To, to David's point, sort of it's better to, when you, when you think about that that way, I think you'll be more successful in that, that sort of firm that you join um, in your career. So, so that's, that's amazing. Um, maybe you could, uh, for, for me, so that audience is not as familiar with, with these terms, but you, you, you guys obviously do deals both in the control side, the minority side, as well as structured equity. You've done a ton of those types of deals over your career. Um, maybe just give people a bit of a flavor of how you think about those different types of structures and what you look for transactions there and what, what would make you successful in each of those. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the vast majority of PE firms do what you might call, you know, LBOs, buyouts, or, or control equity. So in other words, as the PE firm, you are buying more than 50% of the company, often 80, 90, 95, 97% of the company, and you control everything. You can hire, fire whoever you want. You can raise debt. You can pay dividends. You, what, what, literally, whatever you want to do, it's your business. You are in charge. You are in control. Um, in minority or, or structured equity investing, um, and I would say structured equity is sort of a, a type of minority investing, um, it's different. You, you, know, you generally are not in control, uh, but there are other ways to, um, you know, to get comfortable with the fact that you're not in control. The reason most PE firms only do control um, is because they feel like they, you know, if they're writing a, whether it's a $10 million check or a you know, billion dollar check, um, you know, they want to be able to control their own destiny and dictate what the company is going to do. They don't want to be at the whim of whatever management or the other ownership group is going to do. So that's why, you know, a lot of people are, are scared of or avoid um, minority investing or structured investing. Now, um, when you do minority investing, meaning you own less than 50%, you control less than half of the board seats of the company, uh, it's important that you do balance that risk with, you um, you know, with, with either really good upside. So, you know, a lot of venture capital firms, for example, they have no controls, right? They're investing in what, you know, whatever it is, Uber or whoever, um, no controls whatsoever, but they're, you know, they're hoping that maybe they, they can make 10, 20 times their money. So, you know, maybe for them, that's a good trade-off. Um, but what, what, my, what my expertise is in and what I've done in, in my past is more what I'd call structured equity investing, where you are actually getting um, a great deal of rights um, and uh, and things built into your security. So you're not just investing whatever the number is, $50 million into common stock, and then the company gets to do whatever they want to do with it without, um, you know, without talking to you again, and you hope that sometime in the future you get your money back. Um, in, in typical structured equity investing, you're you're going to have some governance and some and some rights around your security. So your security may um, be senior to everybody else's. It may have a, a preference or be preferred equity. So when the company gets sold, you get your money back and maybe even you get some return back before the common equity investors um, uh, get, get anything back. So that's one way. Another way is with governance rights. So you may have seats on the board of directors. Maybe you don't have a majority of the seats, but maybe you have a blocking position. So you have two out of four seats. So you can say no to stuff. Um, or if you don't have a blocking position, you may have specific rights built into the document that say the company cannot do A, B, C, D, E, or F without David's permission. So, you know, you can't make an acquisition, you can't pay a dividend, you can't fire the CEO without my permission or change the budget. So that's, you know, that is the typical um, kind of structured investing that I've been involved in. I think it's really, you know, interesting because for every 10 private equity firms out there, um, you know, at least historically, nine out of 10 of them only did control and couldn't do structure. So that meant for a deal where a company only wanted to raise a certain amount of money or needed capital for an acquisition, if you were a structured equity provider, you had a huge advantage because there were less people competing against you. Um, now, over the last 10 years, a lot more PE firms have spun up their own um, structured equity vehicles. And at the same time, you're seeing a lot of BDCs or lenders um, start to stretch stretch further down the capital structure into that space as well. So it's become a little bit more crowded. 
Um, but I still think it's a really fascinating area because it's so flexible. You can do a lot of different things that um, compete with a number of different people. So it gives you um, an opportunity to move around as different parts of the market get overheated or as opportunities present themselves in other parts of the market. Um, I, I, that's a great answer. Um, one follow up to that, I guess, I was going to jump to special situations in this market, but you mentioned sort of as opportunities arise, I think I always like asking other investors, you know, what that means, because oftentimes you look back and like, oh, that would have been a good time to invest in X, Y, and Z, right? It's, it's always harder to kind of go in. So maybe what are things that you think about? How do you think about the space um, where you are kind of nimble to take opportunities as they arise? Yeah, so the, the, the um, you know, an example that's, that's worth giving is, uh, you know, for a long period of time, it, it was like terrible to be a mezzanine investor because, um, because senior lenders like BDCs from call it 2013 to 2017 would lend you like seven, eight times EBITDA. Um, and, and so as a PE firm, you could take huge advantage of, the, of that attractive senior debt. And there was very little opportunity for mezzanine debt lenders. So as a mezzanine lender, all you could do was try to find the best mezzanine deals available. So you'd end up lending to riskier companies that couldn't get as much debt um, or couldn't get debt from these, these senior lenders, you'd end up going much deeper in the capital structure, arguably basically providing equity, but only getting debt returns. And so, um, you know, to me, that's, that's, the, that, that's a perfect example of why being able to move around in the capital structure is an advantage because you can identify that, hey, there's, there's no good MES opportunities right now. I'd much rather be a senior lender um, or, I'd, or I'd much rather be the equity and take advantage as a borrower of, of all this um, of all this debt that's available. So so that's a, a pivot, for example, that our team at Macquarie made, you know, really hard in the kind of 2015, 2016 timeframe. We moved way away from doing senior lending and much more oriented towards towards equity because of how hot and frothy we thought the debt markets were. Um, and you can make the same case for um, for sector focused funds, um, you know, funds that um, you know, only do technology or only do infrastructure or only do healthcare. Well, you know, right now healthcare and like software investing are really challenging because the multiples have, you know, just been through the roof for four, five, six, seven years now. Um, and it just becomes that much harder. So if you're more of a generalist investor, it gives you an opportunity to, you know, to maybe have learned something from spending time in software, spending time in healthcare, but to be able to pivot away and say, hey, you know, um, software is really hot, but like people aren't paying attention to, uh, I don't know, industrial technology or something like that. So um, that's my point of view. Somebody could easily argue the opposite and say, you've got to be sector focused. You've got to be, you know, because otherwise you don't know what you're doing and it's hard to find an advantage. It's hard to find an edge if you're just a generalist or as people in the hedge fund industry like to say, if you're just a tourist. Um, so I think you could argue both sides of what I just said, but I mean, uh, you know, my, my point of view is colored by my experience. No, that makes sense. I I I I, I agree. With, I, I actually agree with what you're saying. Um, on the on the the only potential advantage that the industry gives you is you're sort of so deep in that you can you can you can you know kind of all the business models and can adapt. But I think you're right. Being that the capital structure flexibility is one of the greatest things, especially in kind of market like today, which is where I want to get to next. Um, you know, having seen the, the PE market over the last 15 years, sort of maybe uh, you know handicap for us where we are in PE today. I mean, and then I think with the context of COVID as well, um, you know, in, in terms of where opportunities can be found. And then a, and a sub question to that for our students out there, how should they think about, you know, kind of the credit investing slash private equity investing for the next three to five years in terms of where there are the greatest opportunities to sort of building their careers out? Yeah, um, gosh, it's really hard to answer. Like, where are we? You know, it's like relative to what? Um, I, I mean, I think the the business has only sort of gone in, you know, mostly one direction for the last um, 40 or 50 years, uh, which is to say more firms, more diversity of firms, you know, whether it's, you know, growth oriented, value oriented, distressed, uh, small, medium, large, sector based. So, um, you know, the, the, the industry has gotten more, um, uh, you know, competitive, more specialized uh, in a lot of different areas. And, and I don't see those being, you know, sort of trends that are going to reverse themselves. I, I think that'll continue to, to occur. Um, and, and now you're starting to see another phenomenon with, you know, the SPAC market, um, 
you know, almost being, a, a, could arguably be an entirely different, you know, sort of subsector of, of, of private equity. It's sort of like public private equity. Um, but anyway, um, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's really hard to answer the question, like, where are we now? I don't know. I mean, I view this business as an, as an absolute return business. Um, you know, private equity is an opportunity to take advantage of a market where, um, where, where hustle and, and intelligence and good analysis um, makes, still makes a real difference relative to investing in public markets. Um, you know, public markets, there's hundreds of hedge funds and all of them have access to basically the same information at the, at the touch of a button. Private equity is a lot harder. You still got to get out there. You got to hustle. You got to find deals. You got to establish relationships with management teams. Um, so to a certain extent, um, you know, un unless and until some sort of technology replaces that function, um, there is still a lot more inefficiency and therefore opportunity um, in the private market. So I view it, you know, really in an absolute sense, like I'm just looking for what I view as good risk adjusted returns, almost regardless of what the market is doing around me. Um, so, you know, what does that mean? I, I don't know. I mean, if it's a, you know, you obviously have to look at like, you know, the fixed income markets for sort of where like the risk-free rate is and the base level of return. And then you add a premium, you know, to there. So, um, so it's relative, you know, the returns you're looking for are relative in that sense. But, um, but, but I think that, you know, if you can find opportunities where you think you've got a chance to, you know, triple your money, quadruple your money, and you think the downside is, is relatively limited, um, you know, I don't, I don't spend so much of my time thinking about being super precise about that. You know, oh, I need four times my upside and 20% downside. Or it's, you know, it's hard to be too, too precise. It's really, you know, there's a lot of qualitative aspects to it as well. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I don't focus too much of my time and attention thinking about where are we, you know, in the cycle. I mean, obviously, you know, right now we're in a unique circumstances with COVID and you do need to think extra hard about what is the future of this? Like, is this business going to exist because of, trends that have, you know, accelerated, like some, like everything that's happening in COVID right now is just sort of accelerating trends that were already there kind of out, outside the aerospace industry, which, which is, you know, suffering really from a, I think a temporary blip, um, you know, other things like commercial real estate, um, retail, um, and, you know, stuff like that, like th these, these trends were already there. They've just been exacerbated by COVID. And, and actually, frankly, you could argue a little bit of that on the on the travel side as well. Like, why, you know, why should I fly to, you know, wherever to to give a presentation like this when you know everybody can do it, um, you know, sitting in their office or, or sitting in their home. So there will be more of that, I, I do think. Um, anyway, I don't know. That was I sort of got off on a little bit of a tangent, but hopefully that answered the question. No, no, I think that was that was really helpful. Um, and then sort of the before we jump to some of the Q and A stuff, I wanted to get a couple a couple more things. Obviously, you've recruited a ton of talent over your time. You know, both you know at Goldman, Macquarie, and now at um, you know Pine Island. Sort of, what do you look for? You you hit a little bit of the resourcefulness earlier, but maybe yeah. you can answer this in the sort of what what has helped you have an accelerated career within private equity in the in the context of sort of what junior people can do uh, to learn from those lessons that that you may have done well. Yeah. Um... I think, um, you know, one, one of the things I did early on was, um, you know, I got, I got very involved in, in sourcing and in deal execution, especially on the documentation side, you know, probably more so, um, than a tip, like even as an analyst, I was getting involved in that. I think part of it was a function of, I, I was on a small team, um, had some people above me leave, you know, anytime somebody leaves, that's an opportunity to step up, um, and, and do more than you had before. And when you first jump in, it you know kind of feels like you're drowning in some cases. I remember going to my first conference by myself and having absolutely no idea what I was doing. I remember reading my first legal document, and you know it probably took me ten hours to read it. Today it would take me thirty minutes to skim through it. Um, so you just you just sort of want to like get in and and jump in, and you, you know you know what your associate or your VP is you know responsible for and spends their time on. So start you know, sort of trying to get involved in, in some of those sorts of things. I think that's, you know, that's something that I did um, successfully. And I mentioned this a bit earlier, but it bears repeating, you know, trying to get involved in, in a diverse array of things, both to broaden your skill set, but also to, you know, maybe figure out what are you good, what are you good at? What do you like? 
So I was working on, you know, buying portfolios of assets. I was working on leasing deals. I was working on equity deals, on lending deals. So I, I got this, you know, exposure to all sorts of different things, which, um, which actually improved my, ultimately, if, if I had just done private equity from like th the first day, I'd be less well-rounded and, and understand it um, less well than I do today because I spent time on other parts of the capital structure and in other types of transactions. Yeah, I know that, that completely makes sense. I think the biggest risk you take early on is by not taking risks and, and sort of not exploring a lot of different things. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a really, really good uh, you know, examples that you gave. Um, before we jump to Q&A, I want to do a quick game with you, David. I'm going to pick up kind of the six or seven industries that you got very familiar with. And then I just want you to kind of maybe for the audience who might be interested in these industries, sort of the top one or two things you look for in investment opportunities in those industries. Um, so maybe we'll start with, uh, you know, aerospace and defense type of industries. What are, what are some characteristics you look for? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, aerospace in particular is really interesting right now because of what we just said with COVID. Um, I, I think the I think the interesting thing right now is if you can find you know, sort of a distressed or special situations um, opportunity where you can buy into a company, you know, sort of at a, at a reasonable multiple of what it's doing today and for the foreseeable future. Um, but with the recognition that you might have some, you know, a lot of upside if things recover back to 2019 levels within a reasonable period of time within uh, two, three, four years. So, you know, like basically manufacturing production is ground to a halt. Um, but if you can find somebody that's still doing business today, but, you know, will roar back when that switch gets turned back on, um, that, that, that'd be, you know, that's a really interesting piece of it. Got it. Um, how about um, consumer retail? You mentioned that earlier. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I personally don't have a ton of background in consumer retail. I mean, I guess what I've seen people focused on there is almost real estate plays. So, I mean, there's, well, there's two parts of consumer retail. The, re the retail piece, I think the, the most interesting thing, the, the thing people have been spending most time on is uh, the, you know, direct to consumer channel and disintermediating a lot of the legacy manufacturers, you know, Casper's kind of been a poster child for that, although they've, you know, floundered a bit um, recently, I believe. Um, but that, you know, that idea that you can just circumvent all the middlemen, um, is pretty pretty interesting on, on the you know more on the retail you know side of things the uh, you know frankly most people are focused on on the real estate you know can I buy something and and separate it from the real estate and and disaggregate it um, that's you know that's kind of uh, sort of uh, every, every mall in the U S being an Amazon uh, you know warehouse kind of thing interesting um, and then yeah. financial services maybe where you spend a lot of time obviously it's a huge industry but any any trends that you're seeing or things you like that are interesting. Sorry, which services? Financial services. So, you know, uh, okay. it could be payments, it could be special, especially finance, you know, whichever one. Yeah, no. Um, so, so look, I mean, fintech is, uh, you know, sort of the hottest area right now. I think, um, you know, in, in terms of what fintech is, it, it means different things to different people. Some people think very futuristic in terms of um, blockchain and, and, and cryptocurrencies, but a, a lot of it to me is just the you know, automation of what was previously very manual tasks, whether it's processing loan applications, gathering data on um, on borrowers, um, on, on customers from a KYC perspective. Um, it, it's really a software play almost. I mean, to me, that's the most interesting part, uh, being able to, you know, uh, you know really help banks um, and, and other credit providers um, gain a lot more efficiencies um, by em employing automation. That's, you know, that's the area to me that's been the most exciting. Yep, uh, got it. Well, so that, that, that's been super helpful. Uh, so we'll, let us start with the Q&A. We had a bunch of people, sure. I, I'd say like a lot of the audience submitted it. So we, we selected a few for, for them to ask. So we'll, we'll, we'll just go through those. First, we've got Taylor Bayer from Harvard Business School, an MBA student there. So Taylor, you could do a quick intro and ask uh, David your question. Hey, David, great to see you. Um, you know, you mentioned this in your, your comments, but given the rise in popularity of SPACs, um, how, how are you seeing these vehicles disrupt the traditional M&A market or PE fundraising? Maybe if you go into a little bit of why Pine Island decided to, to raise a SPAC. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so, so I'm not so sure it's, um, I actually don't think it's, it's, it's sort of disruptive to the PE model. I think it's much more disruptive to the IPO model. Um, it, it's almost like a combination of a private deal and an IPO. That's, that's really how I think about SPACs. You know, ultimately, the companies that um, 
that are going to end up merging with these SPACs. I, well, let me take a step back and just make sure the audience understands what a SPAC is. So a SPAC is a special purpose acquisition company. That's what SPAC stands for. Um, the sponsor, whether it's a PE firm or, or an individual, raises capital uh, from public investors. Um, and then it uses that capital to buy all or part of a company. Uh, and, and basically that company instantly becomes public instead of going through the normal IPO channels. And so from that company's perspective is, is really the interesting way to think about it. So there's only certain companies out there that want to go public. Um, you know, you're not going to take um, a lower middle market private equity acquisition target and, and merge it into a SPAC. They're not, they're not big enough. They may not have a sophisticated enough management team. They may not have enough growth. It might not be, you know, sort of interesting enough of a story. So, so it really only applies to those companies that, um, you know, might have considered going public to begin with. Um, and so from those companies' perspectives, why would I use a SPAC uh, to go public versus going the traditional IPO route? Um, it's, it's really a matter of expediency and, and execution. And then, um, and then also the ability to potentially partner with a sponsor in the effort, which in a normal IPO context, you, you don't really do that. You know, you might put interesting people on your board of directors, but you're not, you don't really have a traditional, you know, deal maker sponsor um, sitting at the table with you, which, which might be an attractive uh, feature for some companies. So for, from the company standpoint, instead of having to, you know, write all these complicated SEC documents, file an S1, go on these complicated road shows, you know, take a lot of risk from a pricing standpoint, you have this vehicle that's already set up, already has, you know, can put a valuation on you. It's actually a relatively straightforward transaction and it's much lower cost. Um, the offset to that is you, you end up giving economics to the sponsor. So the, the lower cost of the actual going public is sort of offset almost entirely by the economics you give away. So, um, you know, bottom line is it's an, I think I view it as an alternative method for companies to go public. Um, in, 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 a, in a faster way and in a way where you can, you know, gain access to potentially an interesting partner. Now, why are private equity firms doing it? The answer to that is it's, it's capital. Um, you know, you, you could go raise a fund and manage that fund and make, you know, make money on the, on the fees and, and the performance incentives on the fund, or you can do the same thing with a SPAC. So it's, it's just another pool of capital. Um, and, and so, you know, private equity folks are economic animals and they're, they're going after where the money is. That's plain and simple why it's happening right now. That's why we chose to do it. You know, it's a distraction from our normal private equity activities, but, it, but it's a good distraction because it's an opportunity to do a really, you know, interesting transaction. Um, and then I guess the reason that uh, investors are interested in it, they're the, you know, the third party in the equation here. Um, is because, uh, you know, SPACs right now, um, you know, can actually be really attractive relative to the alternatives because of what's going on um, with COVID. The, you know, the roadshow process is challenging, getting a deal done is challenging. So you have these vehicles set up that allow somebody to go public without the normal um, headache and, and procedures. And so there, you know, there is some, um, uh, some, some attractive features of that as well. Cool. Thanks, Taylor, for the question. Thanks, Dave, for the answer. Next, we'll go to Nicholas, who's a, an undergrad incoming TMT investment banking analyst as well. At, at, uh, and so, Nick, Nicholas Barron, if you, if you want to ask your question. Hey, David. How's it going? My question Hi. is, what would you say separates a good analyst from a great analyst? Yeah. Um, gosh, I, 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 I'll, I guess I'll repeat what I said before a little bit, but um, you know, the, the, the good analysts sort of like get stuff done and it's fine. The, the great analysts, um, you know, figure stuff out. It's, it's not just about do the comps. It's about do the comps and then let me know in a couple bullets what you think, why you think it, how you arrived at that conclusion. Um, I remember, um, you know, some advice that, that one of my managing directors gave me a long time ago when I was probably an associate. He goes, you know, it would really be helpful. Like, before we go into a meeting, just send me an email with like three or four bullets in it. Tell me like, tell me what you think, like what, what are we meeting about? What are the key points I should be thinking about? It's stuff like that. It's those little extra things that actually help your superior do their job better. That, that's ultimately what defines and, and separates a good analyst from a great analyst. Not, not are you doing your job? Are you making other people's jobs easier? 
Great answer. Nick, thank you for the question. I would just add to that, that, that you're sort of, even as an analyst, you kind of think about re building your reputation over your career, right? So the analysts that I remember the most, and I'm sure David can speak this to, when, when they were our analysts at, at GS or other places, I still remember them like three, four, five, six, ten, you know, 10 years from now because of all the little things that they did. Again, it's not something you do overnight, sort of that reputation that you're able to build over time and sort of doing that extra level, kind of extra level thinking as well as the, the, the work around that. So I think I love that. Next, we've got um, Anjali, who's an undergrad at Columbia. Uh, Anjali, if you, 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 you can uh, ask your question. Hi, David. Um, I'm a first year at Barnard College of Columbia. So my question is for you is, what advice do you have for um, first and second year undergrads thinking of entering the finance realm? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, you know, the, the first bit of advice I would give is, uh, is ask that question early. So congratulations on, on doing that. You know, don't wait till your junior or senior year. It's honestly, it, it gets really, really challenging if you're, if you're only starting to ask that question your junior or senior year. I think, um, I, I think you know, a couple of things. One, you know, getting to the internship is, is the ultimate goal. I don't know what the numbers are these days, but I, I just know that they've been going up and up and up, which is the percentage of people who get their job through their internship is just sky high relative to what it what it used to be. Getting that internship and then turning that into a full time job, you know, is your goal. Um, and so, in order to do that by your junior year, that means in your first or second year, you probably are needing to build a resume that um, you know that will be impressive enough that you can get that job in your junior year. So that means probably finding other types of internships, which may not be, you know, Morgan Stanley or or you know a top PE firm. But maybe it's a second tier firm. Maybe it's you know just something getting you know getting into the industry. Um, so that's that's one thing. But even in order to do that, the first thing you need to do is start networking. And obviously, everybody uh, who's here today is is doing that. But um, I, I used to always tell people this, which is you know before you go on your first interview, I don't care what the interview is, like you need to like sit down and talk to at least like twenty people. And I don't mean eight people or, or even 12 people. I mean, 20 people. It takes, it takes that many people, I think, to, to talk to about the industry, about what they do, how they do it, how they got there, before you really start to understand and be, you know, kind of fluent um, in, in order to present yourself in your case well. Um, you know, maybe you start to get it around like the 12th person you talk to, but you want that next eight people to really refine what you're saying and, and how you think about it. So, um, yeah, network and and just start, you know, adding experiences to the resume now. That is great advice. Good question, Anjali, and great advice. And if you guys are looking for more people to hear from, to David's point, you know, go on Elevate. We've got, I think, 50 plus uh, top firms, PE, IB, you know, VC hedge funds, professionals from there. So I think really speaking the language, to David's point, really important to, to sort of start, start thinking about it that way and thinking about how people think about it. Um, all right, so now let's go to Naveen from the University of Michigan. Naveen, if you want to intro and, and ask a question. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, David. I'm not sure what time zone you're in right now, but um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for taking the time. I know I'm speaking for everyone here. Um, we really appreciate your insight. Um, one question I have would be, what are some of the common pitfalls you see professionals make while investing? Uh, and how can we go about thinking to avoid them uh, especially, you know, if we're earlier on in our career. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a good question. I think, look, the you know when you're when you're working in a in a private equity context, first off, I guess you would just say, you know, it's a, it's a team sport. It's not an individual sport. So, you know, the the chances of you sort of you know making a bad investment decision as a as an analyst is is very low because you're going to have people around you, and you know, there's sort of um, you know, all sorts of checks and balances in place. And it's, and it's a Herculean effort to get a deal done. It takes, you know, a lot of people. Um, that, that said, if you're on like a trading desk, you may, you know, certainly have the liberty to, um, to screw something up. And I, I, think, um, I, I think one way of answering that question is, you know, when you're doing work, it's always more important to get the right answer than to get something done quickly. And I know that even the, you know, the smartest, best traders, you know, like even high frequency traders will, will tell you that don't, don't make a trade just to get it done quickly. You want to get it done right. So it's always worth taking the extra time um, asking for advice. But, but look, I think, um, I, I think a, a more, um, you know, a, a more appropriate bit of advice for the private equity field would be, 
um, to, to collaborate. You know, you're, you, as an analyst, as, as a partner, you don't know everything. You know, you're relying on a, on a team environment. Like at one person trying to do something by themselves is, is way, way, way less powerful than five people working together. And five people working together is way more powerful than five people on the same team notionally, but just doing things individually. Um, so if you see something, it's, I'm going to repeat the thing you say on the subway. If you see something, say something. Like if you see something that, that doesn't seem right, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't add up or I'm curious, like talk to your associate about it. Talk to your, you know, your, your buddy about it who's sitting next to you, which frankly is a challenge in this environment. I think is something that, you know, in, in your guys' seats, I feel bad for because that's a, that's a big part of being an analyst is, uh, being there at nine o'clock at night and turning to the guy next to you and being like, I don't get this. Like, and that's, that's where you learn. Um, so, uh, so yeah, if you see, if you see something, say something, I think is probably the best advice I could give about how not to, you know, screw, don't hide stuff. It doesn't benefit anybody, you know, to, to be like, Oh, I this number is not what my, you know, my, num my MD is not going to be happy if he, if he sees this number or this analysis, cause it's, it's contrary to what he wants to see. That's the worst thing that can happen in an investment environment. That's a good question, Naveen, and I think great answer. Um, I just noticed even at the analyst associate level, people sort of did do what David said, ask the question, but also not assume that everything's right or everything's supposed to be the way they are. Like they, they should be independent in their thinking. And even if they point out something that someone else has already thought of, I think it's value additive because at least the associate or VP is like, hey, this person's being thoughtful about the work and not just doing it. So I think um, that's, that's super helpful. We'll do a couple more. Uh, Liam uh, from Duke University, if you, if you want to ask your question. Sure. So hi, David. Um, I'm a current freshman at Duke. I noticed that you went from being like a business and finance major at Penn State, having a successful career at like Pine Island Capital. Um, so I was just thinking you'd probably be the best person I could ask to ask like how I'd start my career. So I was wondering if there's anything that propelled your career faster than others, or maybe you did you wish you did something differently when first entering the industry. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind when I think about what propelled my career faster is, is attrition, like meaning when people above me left. Um, when I was a first year analyst, I spent 90 something percent of my time for my first three months. So like September to December, when I first started with this one guy, a vice president um, on the team, and he went away for winter break and he didn't come back. He didn't tell anybody he was leaving. He just like, he didn't come back in January. Then they're like, oh, he might be back in a couple of weeks. He didn't come back in February. And then pretty soon you stop asking. But, but that, you know, filling those voids when, um, when people leave or people get reassigned to a different project or whatever it is, you know, having an opportunity to step up and fill those voids is easily the thing that propelled my career the fastest. I just, um, you know, I think I was a combination of lucky to be in a seat where people above me were leaving, but also, I guess, you know, just had whatever, you know, inside of me to, to just, you know, blindly, you know, jump off a cliff when, uh, when I had the opportunity to, to try to, um, you know, take over uh, other people's responsibilities. Great. Good question, Liam. I totally agree with that. Great answer. Um, stepping up uh, and sort of doing the, doing the person senior above, above you's job is probably the easiest key, key to success in this industry. Um, so we'll go to Sean. Uh, Sean is uh, a senior at Columbia. He's also the CEO of the Columbia University Lion Fund. And so Sean, go ahead. Thanks, Roshik. And thank you very much, David, for taking the time to talk to everyone. Um, really enjoyed and appreciated the advice you've given so far. Um, my question was, I know you've sort of touched upon this um, in one of your answers, but um, what do you think are some key trends and emerging sub-verticals in the main industries you covered, like airspace and defense? And what would you say are like the main growth drivers for those industries? Sure. Um, I'll answer the second question first, because that's easy. Almost always the main growth driver in aerospace and defense is the U.S. military. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, they're the ones leading the charge on developing and spending um, technology, even technologies that you consider today to be, you know, consumer devices, you know, things that you'd buy on Amazon or use for yourself probably started life as military technology, whether it's, you know, certain telecom or, you know, today, like uh, a lot of de development going on with virtual reality and augmented reality in the military that, you know, won't be commercial for five or 10 years from now. So, so the answer to what are the drivers is almost, almost always the U.S. military's 
of objectives. Um, you know, and, and on that note, what are they focused on right now as sort of the next generation? Um, space is a big one. Um, so, uh, you know, the U.S. just launched uh, spa the Space Force, um, which will become another, you know, branch of, of the military. Um, that's going to drive a lot of spending. Um, uh, that, that incorporates, you know, not only the vehicles to get there, but also, you know, weaponry. Um, you know, same thing on like hypersonics um, is a new type of weapon system that's, that's being considered. Um, and then, the, you know, the other frontier that's being fought now is on the cyber side. Um, so cyber defense, cyber offense, um, you know, those are all areas that are, um, you know, pretty high focuses right now for the U.S. military and other militaries. Um, but it's, you know, driving a lot of innovation, uh, a lot of new company formation, and, and a lot of investment right now. Excellent. Thanks, David. And the last question will be from Nikhil, who is a, uh, a student at uh, Virginia Tech. So Nikhil, go ahead. Hey, David. Thanks for speaking with us today. So I'm a sophomore at Virginia Tech, and you've already touched on this a little bit, but just to sort of tie it all together, what sort of skill set is required in private equity that differentiates it from other jobs in the investment industry, like venture capital, investment banking, or sales and trading? Yeah, um, yeah, good question. I think so. So the difference, um, you know, I would say is, uh, you know, PE is uh, relative to those other things you just mentioned is a very long term play. Like you're you you make an investment. First off, it takes it might take you a year to get that investment done. You know, from finding the company to researching it, negotiating all the ups and downs in that process. It, it can take you a year just to make the investment. And then you might be in the investment for five, seven years. So I, I think the, the thing that differentiates it the most from lots of other things is just the duration of, you know, the, the strategy, the outlook, the um, uh, perseverance. Um, there's a lot that goes into making a successful PE investment over a very long period of time. And that's, that's hard to appreciate in investment banking, you know, you might work really, really hard for like a couple months, but then the deal's done and you move on to the next thing. Capital markets. I mean, like literally you go home at four o'clock and like you forget everything that you did the day before and you start over again, you know, at nine o'clock the next morning. So, um, and even in venture capital, you know, the, the, the hits tend to happen, um, you know, sort of re relatively rapidly, like, you, you know, you make investments in a business and like, you know, they, they fail quickly or, or then they start to succeed. So like, there's a little bit more, um, you know, in venture capital where it like kind of happens by itself. I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not saying you don't have to be skilled to do it, but I'm just saying, um, you know, in, in PE, it's a lot more hands-on and it takes over a long period of time. Um, so yeah, I guess that would be the answer. Cool. Well, we're right at 11 or, or two o'clock. So David, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for everyone for joining. We'll see you guys next. We have two more events I said in the chat next week with Santa Bridge, the week after with Goldman. But, you know, we really want to thank for, I think on all behalf of our audience, we're going to share this with, our, you know, thousands, two thousands of people that are at on, at, on the Elevate platform on, on YouTube. So look forward to it guys. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so thanks David again. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Yep. Cheers guys.